Warning, this video is nerdy. Like, really nerdy. Check out the links in the description if you want to learn more about any of the topics in this video. Computers, arguably the most insane invention of all time. And since I started YouTube, they're my most requested build. So let's build a computer in Minecraft. I hope you enjoy. First, let's talk about what we want our computer to do. Our computer is going to run programs, but these programs are not what you might be used to, like C++ or Python. <laughs> we need to go a little bit lower. Instead, a program is going to be a list of instructions for the computer to execute, one by one. This is called an assembly language, which is the lowest level language a computer can understand. But what does an instruction actually look like? two main sections, the opcode, which tells the computer which instruction it is, and the operands, or the arguments of the instruction. You can think of this kind of like a function call. The opcode is the name of the function, and the operands are the parameters. In summary, when we code a program, we're really just making a list of instructions. And when our computer runs a program, it executes those instructions one by one. Now let's talk about how our computer will actually work. There are infinitely many ways to design a computer, and there's a lot of research and planning that goes into making one. Luckily though, <laughs> I've already done that. So let me show you how the computer is gonna work. The first component we need is a register file of eight registers. Each register has an address, like a house address, and some data that lives there. I can write to any register, and I can read from any register. Actually, let's make this so that we can read two registers at once. You'll see why in a minute. Next, we'll have an ALU, or an arithmetic logic unit. An ALU performs common operations like addition, subtraction, or even bitwise logic. Once you tell it which operation to do, it performs that operation to the two inputs and outputs the result. Specifically, our ALU is going to have nine different operations. So if I want to add two plus two, it looks like this. Or to subtract seven minus four, it looks like this. Next, I'm going to plug the output of the ALU back into the register file. And now, this is the heart of the computer. We're not done yet, but we can already start executing certain types of instructions. For example, consider an add instruction that takes three operands, a destination register, and two source registers. Its goal is to add the two sources together and put the result in the destination. So let's execute add 312. To do this, we can read registers 1 and 2, tell the ALU to add them together, and write the result back to register three. And just like that, we executed an add instruction. Pretty cool, right? In fact, let's make a similar instruction for every ALU operation. And this gives us our first nine instructions. Okay, but how do we get numbers into the registers in the first place? For that, let's add an instruction called load immediate, which loads a register with a number. That's all it does. Executing load immediate 210 puts a 10 into register 2. Notice how the number we want to load is literally stored on the instruction itself. This is called an immediate. And now, with just these 10 instructions, you can already write a program. Here's a program which calculates 2 plus 2, and it puts the result into register 3. So again, this isn't the full computer, but I think it's enough to start building. Let's start with the registers. These are just memory, which makes me think of locked repeaters. If you didn't know, you can save the state of a repeater by powering the side of it, which locks the repeater and stores one bit of information. Let's go ahead and stack this up. Perfect. Now we have a tower of eight bits, which I'll just say is one register. Writing to this register is actually pretty easy. All you have to do is put data behind it and then quickly unlatch and relatch the locks. And then for reading, what we can do is block the output of the register until someone wants to read it. Easiest way to do that is with a comparator on subtract mode. Cancel it from the side by default, and then when you want to read the register, stop canceling it, and the data comes out. Okay, now we have a fully working 8-bit register. Let's make some more copies, and we'll have a register file. Alright, register file done. I uh, changed the design a little bit to make it smaller, but it, it still uses repeater locks. So let's try this out. I'll start by writing a five to register three. We can do that by putting a five here, a destination three here, and pressing this button. Let's also write a six to register four. And now reading register three shows us a five and reading register four shows a six. Beautiful. 
Next, let's make the ALU. I actually don't really know how to make this, but uh, you know what? I've got an idea. Okay, after some learning from Sammy, I finally have an ALU. Uh, here's the two inputs, and the result comes out over here. And these levers let you choose which operation you want to do. To show you how it works, let's go ahead and put in a 5 and a 3. Turning on addition gives us 8, subtraction gives us 2, and bitwise uh, and gives us a 1. Those are just some of the operations, obviously we have a lot more at our disposal. All right, let's connect these together. Awesome. And with that, the heart of the computer is done. Okay, so far we've got a register file, an ALU, and 10 instructions to work with. But there are still a lot of problems. First of all, where are we going to store the instructions? I mean, we can't fit them in the registers. So let's make a memory bank for them. I'll call it the instruction memory. Address 0 will store the first instruction, address 1 will store the next one, etc. And it's going to be read only, because once a program is in there, we don't want anything to modify it. Great, but we also need a way to keep track of which instruction we're on. For that, let's add a program counter. The program counter stores a single number, which points to the instruction that we're currently executing. So logically, when we run a program, it'll start at zero. And after every instruction, we'll increment the program counter by one, telling the computer to move to the next instruction. For example, let's actually run this program. This is the 2 plus 2 program from earlier. The program counter starts at 0, which tells the computer to execute instruction number 0. So it does, which loads register 1 with a 2. Then we increment the program counter because we're done with that instruction. And now the computer executes instruction number 1. Increment the program counter again and execute the last instruction. And that concludes the program. We have a 4 in register 3, which is exactly what we were expecting. But wait, how does the program counter know when to stop? <laughs> it doesn't. So let's add a new instruction called HALT to the end of the program. HALT freezes the program counter and therefore stops the computer from running. Fantastic. Guys, I just realized we need a name for this computer. What are we doing? That's like the most important part. So if you've got a good name, put it in the comments and I'll pin my favorite one. Anyways, back to explaining stuff. The last big problem with this computer is that currently there's no way to loop. Looping is incredibly important for programs. It allows you to repeat something without actually repeating the code for it. Enter the jump instruction, which takes one operand and address. When it gets executed, it puts that address in the program counter. By doing that, it essentially forces the computer to jump to the instruction at that address. For example, consider this countdown program. It starts by loading a 1 into register 1 and a 10 into register 2. Then it subtracts that 1 from register 2 and jumps to instruction number 2 again, which subtracts 1 from register 2. And then we jump again, over and over and over. And yeah, you get the idea. This program keeps decrementing register 2 forever, and we never reach the halt. So clearly we have loops, but <laughs> they're infinite. It would be really nice to have some kind of conditional jump, a jump that only happens if a certain condition is met. Enter the jump if zero instruction. Wait, is that really the acronym? Uh, how about we call it branch if zero instead? <laughs> Just like jump, it takes an address, but it only jumps if the last ALU operation resulted in a zero. Now let's see what happens when we insert a branch if zero instruction into that countdown program. It starts out the same way that it did before, counting down in register 2. But now, when this subtraction results in a 0, the branch instruction that comes after it says, hey, take my branch to number 5, which is halt. And now, register 2 counts down to 0 and stops. Beautiful. Let's keep building. For the program counter, I think I actually made one before by accident. I, I know how that sounds, but like when I was making a line drawer for uh, this video, there was a component that did the exact same thing. Yeah, oh my god, look at what I found. I can increment it to the next instruction with this button, and I can jump to a new one by putting it here and pressing this button. Well, that is extremely lucky. Program counter taken care of. Next, let's make the instruction memory. 
So far, I've been showing you instructions as strings of words, and that's totally fine. That's how an assembly language works. But at the lowest level, everything is just a binary number to the computer, even the instructions. And that's what truly gets stored in the instruction memory, a bunch of binary numbers, each representing a unique instruction. So what I'm thinking is we can store that binary as a tower of barrels behind comparators. If an instruction is, for example, 101, I would place barrels like this. And as you can see, when we uncancel the comparators, it reads 101. So let's just copy this a bunch of times. All right, instruction memory looking good. I wasn't sure how many instructions we actually want to be able to store, but uh, currently it can store up to 64 instructions. If we need more, we can always expand this later. Now let's connect everything together. Oh man, this is looking pretty cool already. If I did everything right, everything should be hooked up. So at this point, I think it's time to code our first program in Minecraft. Let's code that countdown program from earlier. This is gonna be kind of painful because right now the only way to code a program is to do it by hand, placing barrels manually. But uh, we gotta do what we gotta do. I'll be back in a bit. Okay, that was absolutely horrible, but the countdown program has been coded. When I press this button, we should see a 10 countdown to zero. Okay, we got a 10, nice. Yes! <laughs> That's such a cool feeling. I've never made a redstone build where I can actually code things. I definitely should have done this earlier. That's so freaking cool. We've made some amazing progress, but there's one more thing we have to talk about. As of now, this is our computer, and this is our list of instructions. But here's the problem. Right now, the only data that programs can use is the data in the registers. That is not very much to work with. Only, what, eight bytes? So let's give it some more. We have two options here. On the one hand, we could just expand the instruction memory and make some room in there for data. That would work, and this would be called a von Neumann architecture. On the other hand, we could keep data separate from the instructions in its own brand new memory bank. And this is called a Harvard architecture, where the instructions and data are separated. I personally feel like Harvard is just the cleaner way to do it, and it's a little bit less confusing. So let's do it. But how are programs gonna use this new data memory? Well, let's add two more instructions, load and store. Load and store act as a transfer method between the registers and the data memory. Load will load the data from an address into a register, and store does the opposite, storing data from a register into an address. Perfect. Now, if a program needs more memory, there's a lot more to work with. All right, you know what's next. <laughs> Let's build a data memory and hook it up to the computer. God, that took a while, but I think it's done. Dude, can I just say, I love how square this thing is. It makes it look more like a, like a real life CPU. Also, now that I think about it, we should probably make a screen and maybe some inputs, right? Because right now it's kind of just a box. It's pretty hard to tell what's going on. Well, back to it. Dude, this looks so good. We have a little like uh, Xbox style controller, nice little screen and a number display too. I'm super happy with that. And with that, we're done. I'll see you in the showcase.